If you're here, it's because you want to think seriously about your own formation as a kingdom leader. I'm Kevin Minoy, and I invite you to participate in the diverse community of Christian leaders, both anchored and reaching in the work of God. Hang on while we push deep into the crevices of leadership formation, whether as a pastor, educator, organizational leader, or business person. Let's go. Identity is perhaps the most important question for us to address as institutions, as churches, and as leaders, and that's you. So I'm really glad you're taking time with this mini-series of courses, and I hope that since you uh, watched the first of these, uh, this series, that you were able to take some private time, perhaps with someone that you trust, you shared your iceberg with them, you took some time to draw your iceberg, and then you were able to share it with your family, your spouse, your parents, maybe a best friend, or perhaps a small group, maybe a pastor or a counselor. I'm hopeful that that has been a good exercise for you. And today there's going to be another exercise when we're done with this particular session on ministry identity. Clearly, when I talk about ministry identity, it sounds as though I'm just talking to pastors or Christian workers. But I want you to understand that really ministry is much more than being positioned in a role in the church or in a Christian organization. You may be a business leader. You may be an educator in public schools. You may be an entrepreneur. You may be in a corporation, mid-management, or perhaps on the line somewhere. Wherever it is that you are, if you are walking with Jesus, you are in ministry. So when we talk about ministry leadership or ministry identity, it's a critical question for all of us to explore, irrespective of the particular role that we may have. Remember, Identity deals with that part of the iceberg that's beneath the waterline, where people can't see. Activity, performance, mission deals with the top of the iceberg, the role that we have, the position that we hold, the the things that we do from day to day. And that proceeds out of a deep sense of identity. So when we talk about ministry identity, we're talking about the nature, the character of your formation in the bottom of the iceberg so that what you do, whether it's in secular work or whether it's in church work, vocational ministry, we call it, Whatever it is, you are doing ministry. So we often talk about uh, ministry as vocation. That's for people who are called full time to give their full lives and futures to the work of God through the church and Christian uh, organizations and leadership. And then we talk about vocation as ministry. That area to which you have been called really, is your place of ministry, whether that's uh, teaching children in a public school, whether that's programming computers, whether that's uh, being a CFO or being an accountant or a project manager, whatever it is, your vocation, that is what you do, is your ministry. So either way, we are talking about an identity for the ministry that you do. Now, I'm not going to spend time talking with you specifically about the particular platform that you have, although I wish we had some time and maybe in a future series, we'll talk about the nature of vocation, the vocatio, the vocare, the the vocalization of God in your life to call you to a path where you flourish as an individual using your gifts and your passion and your personality to fulfill what God has intended for you particularly. That's another conversation. But in this time, I want to spend time talking with you about the levels of that call, the levels of that vocation, because it has a bearing on what you do and how you live out the position that you hold. To do that, let me, let me describe for you briefly what I call the levels of the call that help to describe or define ministry identity. When we read through Scripture, we find that many were called, but few responded. We read about Jesus, that, he, that, that, that God through Jesus, he was not willing that any 
should perish, but that all would come to eternal life. In other words, God has invited every person that ever has been born or ever will be born, he has invited every person into a relationship of discipleship with him through Jesus Christ. That call is on every person's life. Not everybody responds to it. Some people say, no, I don't want to walk with Jesus. And and that's part of what drives our missiology or our mission or our evangelism or our outreach into our communities. See, everyone has that invitation open from God before them, but not everybody responds to that. So there, you see, we have a call or an invitation to discipleship, the first level of ministry. We are called into discipleship, ministry in which we ourselves are being formed in the likeness of Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus, to walk in the dust of the master, so to speak, in the footsteps of the master, to learn to be Christ-like, you see, and that's that's a huge calling. That's a huge ministry. And in that role, we are therefore called to make other disciples, to invite other people onto that journey with us so that we don't walk alone on that path, but we are bringing other people with us. That's a ministry that you have. No matter what your position is, every person who is a disciple is called to make disciples, you see, to reproduce yourself, to multiply yourself to mentor others in following Jesus as a disciple. So there's ministry of discipleship to which every person, you, are called. First, we respond to that call ourselves, and then we engage in the corporate, social, relational discipleship of bringing other people along with us. And that's that's an identity that you have that underlies everything else that you do. You are a disciple of Jesus, and as a disciple, you are multiplying yourself in other disciples. You see the identity, who you are, a disciple of Jesus, what you're doing, multiplying yourself in bringing other disciples along the way with you. There is the identity and mission, the duality that we talked about last time. Now, that's an invitation that's gone to every person even though not every person has responded to it. But there's another level of ministry identity or calling or vocation that God issues to people. And we find that really in this deeper call of what I I like to phrase as servanthood. John 6 is an account of when Jesus was talking about the the communion, eating the flesh, drinking the blood. Now, that sounds really gory, and I know for a lot of people who don't understand the the constructs, the concepts of, of being a Christ follower, it's very foreign to them to talk about eating uh, the body and drinking the blood. But, but you understand what we're talking about here. It's, it's emblematic. It's symbolic. It is, it is an, a sacramental act of internalizing Jesus. And that goes beyond our discipleship. It goes to the point where in those, in those passages, in John 6 and verse 60 and following, we find that the disciples who heard those words came back and responded to Jesus, and they said, this is really hard. And this takes an awful lot because you're asking us to give up the totality of ourselves to become completely subservient to your call so that our interests are no longer a factor. And yeah, that's exactly it. That's the call to being a servant of God. And that's another whole series that we'll get into another time. Being a servant of God means that you surrender your rights. Your nature is reformed or transformed into the likeness of God through Jesus. And your priorities are realigned to conform to what God wants, not what you want. That is a call to servanthood. And though many may respond to the call to discipleship as an identity for the ministry that they do, 
there are fewer that respond to that call to servanthood. Even though, even in John 6, we read, this is too hard. We don't know that we want to do that. We don't want to go that far. We want to go into the river up to our knees, but we don't want to go in up to our waist. That's a little scary because it's giving up too much control, you see. And so fewer answer that call to servanthood, where there's a total self-giving, a total death to self, you see. And then there's a third level of this call of ministry identity. And that level is one that that has a lot of different approaches to it. Many different people will use different language. And and I happen to call it the call to priesthood. Now, I don't mean in, for example, the Episcopal or Roman Catholic or Eastern churches, that positional priesthood. I'm talking about that priesthood after the Levitical order in the Old Testament. That call where all of one's life is given to the ministry of God's mission in the world. Uh, And uh, uh, there's a renouncing there's a renunciation of the temporal in favor of that calling. We often allude to this when we when we we talk about people going into the ministry. You see, ministry as vocation, that ordained set apartness, and there is a difference. Now, I know that we all believe in the priesthood of all believers, so all of us have access to God. But there are some that are set apart. There are some that are called specially into this level of ministry identity that says, I give up all my rights, I give up all of my will, and I devote myself completely to the work of God in the world through the church. That's a Levitical priesthood. And let me, let me remind you what that looks like. And I use that term and others use different terms, and that's fine. But the idea is here. When Moses led the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, one of the things that happened was they got to the camp and there was a moment when Moses had to order the camp because the people were so many and the the functions were so difficult and complex that that what he wound up doing is he assigned locations around that tent, you you know, around the tabernacle. He assigned locations to the different tribes in the wilderness. He assigned a location to Benjamin, to Judah, and so forth and so on through the tribes. When it came to the Levites, though— He didn't give them an assigned location. He said, your place is here in the temple, and your place is to take the presence of God into the various peoples of this encampment, and your place is to bring the needs of those people back into the presence of God. It's that go-between. It's that standing in the gap. It's that priestly function of being God to people and bringing the hurts and brokenness of people into the presence of God. It's that Levitical identity that has no home, has no place in the camp, except being God's ambassador. Now, again, let me underscore, that doesn't make those people any better than any others who have not responded to that call to vocational ministry. What it does, though, is it gives a unique kind of identity to those people, and that is often these days identified in those moments of ordination. When when I lay my hands on a, a young woman or man being ordained into pastoral ministry, there is a sacredness about that moment because they are surrendering all of their rights, all of their agenda, all of their future, all of their personal hopes and dreams. They're surrendering all of that for the sake of being fully devoted to the work of God through the body of Christ, the church. It is a sacred moment, and there is a sense in which the Holy Spirit visits those moments in very, very mysterious but powerful ways, and then goes on to shape that person's life as a pastor, as an ordained minister, with an identity that is forged in that Levitical priesthood, that calling. 
It's not any better than one who is called into computer science or into the business world or into education. It's different. Remember when Joshua brought the tribes into the promised land. Again, he assigned locations. And even to this day, you can go to your, your maps of the people inhabiting the promised land. And you will see where Judah was here and Issachar was here and, and the various tribes were assigned places in the promised land. Where did he assign the, the Levites? They didn't get any land. They didn't get a home. They were assigned to the temple. Take the power of God, the grace of God into all the land, to all of the peoples, and represent the needs and brokenness of the people in the presence of God. And you remember in the Old Testament, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, atoning for the sins of the people. You remember those stories. And then when Jesus came, he became that priest that ended that process. He became the priest who intercedes for all of us. So that, that has been fulfilled. And yet there are people who are called to that ministry identity of being vocationally called to ministry. That is a deeply formed identity in the roots, in the nuances, in the secret places of full surrender. I often tell young pastors, when you're called into pastoral ministry, when you are called into the ordained ministry, which means you are called to that level of calling, to full devotion to the work of God in the world through the church, you give up your rights. You give up your right to a particular salary, a particular location, a particular level of existence. You give it all up. You surrender it. What you receive is only at the hands of God through the church. <laughs> and it becomes dangerous when young pastors begin to negotiate or vie for certain levels of salary, for certain levels of recognition, certain levels of power and influence, because that begins to erode the very nature of that deep, deep Levitical call to ministry as vocation, wherein all of the temporal needs of this world are surrendered in favor of moving at the impulse of God to order the church, guide the church, lead the church. And many of you are being called into that level, that identity, that ministry identity. Don't ever hold it as a badge of honor. Never hold it over another person because there is equal importance to those who are called to be the CFO of a company as a believer. The ministry they have is powerful. I often tell people that, that those going into business are perhaps the most influential people in a global culture today for the sake of Jesus Christ, even more so than pastors. It's different. So don't think that your call into ministry vocation, ministry, uh, ministry as vocation, is somehow better or higher than any other call. That was a problem that was resolved in the Reformation with the priesthood of all believers. So don't misconstrue it as a hierarchy of calling. Just understand the nature of your ministry identity and don't shortchange it. Don't try to negotiate. Don't try to get the best of both worlds. I want this. I want this salary. I want this size house. I want this, si this recognition. And I want to be considered to be a pastor, an ordained minister. No. When you answer that call to ministry as vocation, to that Levitical priesthood, that level of the call, you surrender everything in favor of what God has called you to. Now, just as last time, I'd like to encourage you to take some time privately and to do a little homework, perhaps. Get alone, pray, reflect on the level of your call, your ministry identity, whether it's uh, as a disciple disciple and a discipler, whether it is in the level of servanthood, whether it is that vocational ministry to pastoral leadership ordering the church, whatever that calling is, whatever that ministry is, your identity is fundamental to the effectiveness of what you do 
for the rest of your life. So get get alone, take some time, reflect upon that, and then write a paragraph or two that perhaps pinpoints or describes that experience or perhaps series of experiences wherein you sensed that deep, deep calling of God to be identified in ministry. Can you do that? Can you remember that moment? And it may be a struggle for some of you, and that's okay. Do your best to describe that. Because as you write that, as you put that into words, it secures it in your own mind and heart. Take time to do that. Share it with someone that you love, someone that's close to you, and let that be a moment, uh, a moment that secures your ministry identity. Let me encourage you that who you are is more important than what you do. The lure of defining yourself by your performance is stronger than you might think. So join me in upcoming weeks as we explore the whole leader God created you to be.